In the 1980s, there were toy lines that were clever, like Mask, and there were toy lines that were big, like Star Wars. But toy lines that relied on gimmicks rarely lasted long, and Star Wars, while successful in the early 80s, was a child born in the 70s. So when you ask a kid of the 80s to name the big three, that means He-Man, G.I. Joe, and Transformers, mega toy lines born in the 80s that ruled the majority of the decade and turned away all challengers. Star Wars generally isn't included and stands alone. Mysteriously, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is often overlooked as well, which is weird because like the big three, it was insanely popular, it was staggeringly successful, and it was made in the 1980s. However, like Star Wars, Ninja Turtles is a transitional action figure line, born into one decade, but finding its years of success in another. Kenner Star Wars launched in late 1977 and springboarded into the 1980s, but never quite made it to 1986. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was launched by Playmates Toys in 1987 and blasted off in the 1990s, finally sputtering out in 1996. Like Star Wars, Ninja Turtles was an unexpected toy aisle success. And just like Star Wars, Ninja Turtles' success lasted far longer than anyone could have predicted. And there's one more similarity between Star Wars and Ninja Turtles. The toy line is huge. Like, really, really huge. Before Playmates came along, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles didn't have much of a merchandising presence. In fact, the only notable mention is the short-lived role-playing game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. It was a great role-playing game based on the original comics, but it was a niche product for the comic book crowd. My first exposure to the Ninja Turtles was with that first commercial from Playmates Toys. I couldn't get past the name. I was only nine years old, and I was laughing at the name of the toys. You have to realize that back then there weren't any mutants outside of horror films, and Ninja Turtles weren't a part of the pop culture landscape like they are today. Plus the idea of combining a character like Storm Shadow, the coolest ninja of all time, with a turtle? This was theater of the absurd. The success of the Turtles produced a slew of imitators with even sillier names that haven't aged nearly as well. Biker Mice from Mars, Street Sharks, Barnyard Commandos, Samurai Pizza Cats, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles made toy marketers think they could sell just about anything. So with a perceived silly name on a truly strange idea, Playmates Toys had an interesting challenge on their hands. They were collaborating early on with Fred Wolf Animation, so the excellent miniseries animation made it into the first toy commercials, really creating a strong synergy between the figures and the cartoon. But you can tell that Playmates had been pretty far along in the design phase when Fred Wolf Animation was brought on board. In order to differentiate the turtles for kids, they knew weapons alone wouldn't cut it, so they made each turtle a different shade of green, gave each turtle a different facial expression, different color headbands and pads, and put their first initial on their belt buckles. Overkill? Maybe, but no one complained. They also didn't have pupils in their eyes, making them look much more like the original comic turtles than the cartoon versions. I guess Fred Wolf realized they were going to need pupils for the purposes of animated expression, but the figures were already locked down. The earliest figures in the series can be spotted due to their squishy heads, made of the same material as Masters of the Universe figures. Playmates revised this about a year or so into the figure line, reissuing all of the original figures with hard plastic heads. The soft heads are the originals, but can discolor if not stored properly. The first figure to enter our house was Donatello. My brother picked him out, and I remember noting he had nice detail on his shell and a holster for his staff. I also noticed he had a very specific action stance, with one foot doing this tiptoe thing, and arms that didn't bend at the elbow, but swiveled in a wonky fashion. 
This design was so he'd look cool with his bow staff in a specific position, and he did look cool in that one position. But because he was difficult to keep standing and the nature of his arms as they were, it got a little frustrating. I went to K&K Toys and picked up Michelangelo. It wasn't long afterward that I spotted a major design flaw. The nunchucks he comes with were connected by a thin, brittle plastic cord, and they were on a plastic sprue in a straight line. The instant I tried to curl them to put them on his belt, it was game over. They broke. For a while, I used scotch tape to keep them together. It wasn't long before I clipped the broken cords off entirely and tied them together with string. One of the biggest advantages to the Turtles over most other action figures was also a liability for your accessories. The Turtles themselves had the best grip for their weapons, better than any other action figure series. Perfectly designed, the weapons snapped in and never fell out. But actually getting them out without destroying them in the process could be tricky, and we lost a few handles along the way. Many of the other figures don't hold weapons well at all, like General Trag and Shredder. The weapons either fall out of their hands, or you need a jackhammer to get their fingers apart to get the weapons in their palms. A ton of the figures came with ninja stars as well. If you ever collected these toys, you're probably still finding these ninja stars randomly to this day. Many of the earliest figures came with weapons racks that actually couldn't hold any weapons. These included a pair of fist daggers, but only Raphael was capable of carrying one of those on his belt. Playmates also packed the figures with an alternate weapon, a bladed short axe called a comma. Everyone had a comma. Comma, 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 chameleon. The weirdest weapon has to be April O'Neil's 007 style video camera pistol combination. I thought April was a TV reporter, but she's apparently Charles Bronson from Death Wish, plugging crooks with her semi-automatic 45. All of the early Playmates figures were given a funky stance, but Shredder is the clear winner. He can't stand up because of a strange crouching position and tiny feet. He looks like he's taking a dump while doing a magic trick. The foot soldier isn't much better, looking more like a gorilla than a robotic ninja. The lack of movement in the legs and hips of these figures becomes a major problem if you're a collector, and not just in getting them to stand up on their own. At the time, Ninja Turtles figures were some of the most durable toys you could buy, but after more than 25 years, that construction has become a real liability. He-Man figures were partially constructed with a rubber cord connecting the legs. G.I. Joes were modular with all the pieces connected around a rubber O-ring and hook. Many figures, like Star Wars, were simply two halves of a torso that secured the five joints for the arms, legs, and head. Playmates Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was far more complex. Inside the two halves of the torso of many of the figures was a white plastic rail with three ball joints branching off of it at the neck and leg sockets. The already limited mobility of the figure's limbs gets worse over time as the plastic limbs age and shrink slightly around the ball joints, eventually resulting in seized joints. Attempting to unseize the joint can result in the ball joint breaking away from the inner plastic rail and the damage is irreparable. April O'Neil is one of the more storied figures in the early line. Clearly based on her original appearance in the comics in blue coveralls, Playmates made the jumpsuit bright yellow with white boots. Originally, the figure was exactly that, with the word turtles on the back. Not sure why they needed to add that, but okay. Early on, someone must have decided the character wasn't detailed enough, and they added a blue stripe to her legs. Later on, Playmates re-sculpted her head and added orange details to the jumpsuit. Then they added purple details to the jumpsuit and gave her windswept hair. Then they just made her a hooker. As a kid, it seemed that this figure line was expanding faster than a gremlin soaked in water. That's because in the background, Playmates and Mirage Studios were collaborating on action figure designs. Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird were so busy with the business of the Ninja Turtles, they told their artists that any design for an action figure they sold to Playmates, they could keep the profits. That may be the reason that every animal you can think of was turned into a mutant action figure for this line. Geckos, crocodiles, gorillas, moose, manta rays, ducks, lions, dragons... It's an insane lineup of figures. A number of these characters were repurposed for the kid-friendly Archie comic series, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures, and eventually got their own spin-off comic, The Mighty Mutanimals. Playmates was working on multiple fronts to add to the figure pantheon. In addition to artist submissions, Playmates mined the original comics for inspiration as well, adding Casey Jones, the Fugitoid, and the Triceraton into the line. The toy company also reached out and licensed the independent comic Yasagi Yojimbo, adding the Samurai Rabbit into the toy series, even though he had nothing to do with the Ninja Turtles. Fred Wolf would manage to get Yojimbo and Casey Jones into the cartoon show at various points. 
Playmates and Fred Wolf also made sure to produce the cartoon-specific characters like Mutant Fly Baxter Stockman, Krang, Genghis Frog, and General Trag. One of the unfortunate characteristics of the Playmates figures, though, is the over-the-top sculpting given to most of the toys. Very early on after the initial wave, subsequent figures were sculpted with all kinds of exaggerated details, which always bothered me. Why does General Trag bear no resemblance to the cartoon version? Furthermore, why does he have a spider permanently molded to his forearm? What is the added benefit of this? This design trend plagued the vast majority of Ninja Turtles figures, to the point that Muckman had a manhole cover permanently attached to his foot, and Wingnut had an unnecessarily ripped up uniform, among many, many other examples. Maybe they thought this would make the figures more interesting for kids, but for this kid, it was just annoying and made the figures feel like they were aimed more at preschoolers than action figure age kids. Give me the figures clean and I'll imagine the damage and weathering when I need to, but I can't unimagine a spider on his arm or a snake on his leg or a lobster on his shoulder. They already had plenty of opportunity for gross out play with the mutagen cans they sold in toy stores right alongside Masters of the Universe slime and real Ghostbusters ectoplasm. Sculpting slime and damage onto these figures is overkill. Playmates also jumped into the same quicksand trap Kenner did with the real Ghostbusters by making variation upon variation of gimmicky turtle characters. You had talking turtles, wacky action turtles, undercover turtles, space cadet turtles, surfer turtles, sewer spitter turtles, rocker turtles, mutant military turtles, police turtles, sewer sports turtles, skateboarding turtles, cave turtles, wacky wild west turtles, head dropping turtles, smash em turtles, mutating turtles, night ninja turtles, road ready turtles, sewer hero turtles, adventurer turtles, cyber samurai turtles, kung fu turtles, pizza tossing turtles, shogun turtles, sumo turtles, metal mutant turtles, Farmer Turtles, Birthday Turtles, Stretch Turtles, Star Trek Turtles, and a bazillion one-off versions of various turtles in between. Really? At the end of the day, the vast majority of these characters are as worthless to a kid as they are to a collector. They don't represent anything authentic, and the sheer number of them is staggering. I took a lot of flack when I said, I kind of thought they looked a little... toddlery. But are you honestly going to sit there and tell me that farmer turtles and birthday turtles don't undermine the credibility of these toys? There was no birthday party He-Man or farmer Optimus Prime. Out of all of these variations, only a handful are worth your time. Foremost of these are the movie star turtles, based on their appearance in the live-action films, specifically from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze. They look good on display, despite the fact that they are made from a rubbery plastic and have no articulation in the elbows. They also have a hidden secret. They come packed with weapons that look almost identical to those of the original turtle figures, but with one important difference. They're made from a far more durable, softer plastic. Which meant I picked up a second movie star Michelangelo as a kid and gave his weapons to my original Mikey. Problem solved. The movie star series also had a redone foot soldier, Toka and Razor, Super Shredder, and a movie Splinter that actually looks amazing. The Movie Star series was revisited with the third film and Samurai versions of the Turtles for what it's worth. But we already had the original Samurai Leonardo from the cartoon line. But the idea of a ninja being a samurai is just a stupid concept. That's like a dog dressing up like a cat. Another notable variation were the Toon Turtles in which all four turtles were made to look like the cartoon versions, with pupils and goofy grins. These landed in 1992, as part of a larger sub-series that focused on secondary cartoon characters, like the Neutrinos, Irma, all of April's co-workers at Channel 6, and a repainted Shredder. The problem is, all four of the turtles are scary hideous, with Leonardo the stuff of nightmares. Personally, I think the most interesting variation Playmates did were the storage shell turtles. What I liked about them was the utilization of the turtle shells as accessory holders. I just think it's a cool idea. The vehicle and playset lineup was just as epic as the figure selection. Playmates provided great smaller lower price point vehicles like the Cheap Skate and the Turtle Cycle, which were durable little toys that also made it into the cartoon. The problem with these was due to the figure's lack of posability. They had a tough time riding them. The turtles could only grab one of the cycle handles, and the foot pegs provided were never spaced properly for the turtles' stances, so it got awkward quickly. Playmates released larger vehicles with equally mixed results, the flagship being the turtles' party wagon. As I've already reviewed this toy, I'll just say I'm not backing down from my position. No steering wheel, no cabin accessories or interior play value, this thing is just a big yellow brick. 
A few years later, they would release the Channel 6 news van, which was based on the Turtles party wagon mold. And inside, they redid the interior, which coincidentally makes it look a lot closer to Donatello's original design than the one we got. Far more interesting and daring is the Playmates Turtle Blimp. Utilizing an actual vinyl inflatable dirigible, this is an impressive piece. But alas, adding helium won't make it float. The blimp is complete with six bombs that can be released simultaneously with the pull of a trigger. It's a really cool toy and extremely unique. Both the party wagon and the blimp are packed with bombs. Since when do the Ninja Turtles go around dropping ordnance on people? The bad guys had an anachronistic vehicle called the Foot Cruiser, a flying purple Cadillac, which was actually based on the flying cars ridden by the Neutrinos in the miniseries. Their cars were red and blue, and when you mix red and blue, you get purple. So, yeah. There was also a smaller enemy vehicle called the Knucklehead, which was a robotic spider that descended from a retractable cable system and would grab the good guys and catch them in these robotic spider arms. I always found that creepy because I hate spiders. Ah! Later in the toy line, Playmates released Krang's giant android body. It's weird that they waited so long to produce this because it's in the climax of the original miniseries and Krang is always seen in it after that. With his original action figure relegated to a goofy walking bubble, this toy is a must-have for your Turtles toy collection. There were two major playsets produced. The first is the sewer playset, a nice miniature section of the Turtles' underground home, with reconfigurable tunnel pipes, an elevator, periscope, and swinging wires. There's also a weird view screen where bad guys can peek through. It's supposed to simulate an evil message, but it just looks like Shredder as being a peeping Tom. Also a little disappointing is a lack of adequate surface area up top to park the party wagon on the street, and the copious amounts of mutagen puddle stickers that make the interior look filthy. I just can't stand damage stickers. Then there's this racy pinup sticker above the bed. That's no joke. This was a real sticker with the playset and it was in the bed for the Turtles. Where I give Playmates a big salute is in the forethought they gave their second major playset, the Technodrome. This is a massive recreation of Krang's underground fortress, complete with a jail cell, a mutating table, an armory, a computer system, and Krang's throne. Where Playmates really knocked it out of the park was designing the Technodrome to connect directly to the sewer playset via the pipes. In the miniseries, the Turtles locate the Technodrome in a giant underground cavern adjacent to the sewers, so Playmates made sure the Turtles can go through the sewer pipes right into the villain's lair. It's a little weird having the good guys and bad guys together like neighbors, but it's the thought that counts. Well played, Playmates toys. Playmates Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles isn't everyone's cup of tea. The figures are outlandish, wildly varied, and give off a less mature vibe than a lot of other figure lines. On the flip side, the core characters are iconic, all of the figures and accessories are vividly colored, and as you can see, they have a serious impact on display. It was the last major cartoon-based toy line of the 1980s, and it left a massive footprint. A massive two-toed footprint. Thanks so much for watching this video. Really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more, please remember to click subscribe. If you want to see more of our cartoon rants, click the links below. And if you want to see more retro blasting retro greatness, we have over 150 videos to choose from. You can visit our channel page. Thanks again, and we hope to see you on the next one. And, oh my god, I did it again. <laughs> oh, I did it again. Okay, I pull my thumb down. That's what I do.